Welcome to Foothills Christian Church. I'm Douglas Peak, and I want to personally invite you, whether you're here on campus uh, and you're new or you've been coming back, if you're watching online, doing church at home, you're watching this later, I'm inviting all of you to be a part of our community of faith because we want you to have a place where you can grow and connect. And if you want to know a little bit about us anonymously, check us out. All you got to do is text FH New to 72000. If you're interested in journeying with Jesus through baptism, you can text FH Baptism to 72000. And uh, in the uh, upstream video where they talked about when things practicing generosity, said a lot of people have questions about giving and what's it like. And so we put together a new teaching on it. There's no appeal. There's no ask. It's just simply, this is kind of what the Bible teaches. And it's a totally different perspective than most people have. So you can text FH giving to 72,000. If you're picking up a common theme, you are. And that is 72,000 is a way, that number that you can text. And if you have the right keyword, whether it's FH Baptism, FH New, you can text FH Events. And it gives you all kinds of stuff anonymously, directly to your phone. And it helps you in the process of digital, what we call digital discipleship. Now we're in a series called Storybook Endings. We're simply asking the question, what relationship story are you writing is it a storybook Disney ending uh, or is it a Greek tragedy? And so that's what we're asking. And today uh, we are going to stay in our text, Ephesians chapter 4. One of the things about Foothills that we like to do is like to take a passage of Scripture and kind of camp out on it, dig into it, and then use it each week throughout the series. Because one of our mottos about our church is fluff is not enough. You know, we just don't want to skim over stuff. We need to really dig in. We need to be rooted and prepared for all the crazy stuff that's going on in our own lives and in the world around us. So last week in this series, we said, uh, don't be that guy. And so this week, I thought I would dare to go where angels fear to tread. <laughs> and this message is called, don't be that girl. Now, you would think, ladies, you would think that you would be the happiest people in the world. I mean, there is more opportunity. There is more open doors. New stats are coming out now. Women between the ages of 23 and 33 make more money than their male counterparts. There's more uh, uh, security. There, I mean, you just look about all the factors for women and ladies and all the opportunity and all the equality and all of the access and all of the education. Women are now more highly educated than their male counterparts. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. You would think you'd be the happiest people in the world, right? That's what you would think. But guess what? All the research, all the surveys all come back and have a very unique finding. And that is, is that women are really unhappy. They're really disappointed. And so the result now is in America, and particularly, and I'm speaking generally, is that the, the result is, is that the world is filled with women who are lost, they're lonely, they're discouraged. You don't have to be that girl. You know, the world is filled with women who are disappointed. They're directionless, disillusioned with their friendships, with their dating life, with their marriages. Well, you don't have to be that girl. The world is filled with women who struggle with second-guessing their decisions, flip-flopping. They're insecure about these most important relationships in their lives. Constantly asking questions like, well, am I a good mom or not? How do I know? Is my marriage any good? If it is, then why am I not more happy? Why can't I be more happy than I am now? Well, you don't have to be that girl. You see, the world is filled with women unprepared for the obstacles, the difficulties, the setbacks, and challenges that they're going to face throughout their life. You don't need to be that girl. The world is filled with women who want more, women who dream big dreams, women who uh, have greater hope for their families and for their kids, but they have no idea how to get 
there from A to B. Well, you don't have to be that girl. So we're going to be in Ephesians, and we are going to be digging into chapter 4. But before I do that, I want to read a funny story. Last week I read a funny story from Dave Barry, and then uh, this one I, is my favorite of all. And it's humorous, it's over the top, filled with uh, stereotypes, and that's what makes it so funny. Um, so anyway, ladies, I, I just want you to know is that you look at the relationships in your life differently. Now, when we started this, we started off in the very first session about Genesis uh, chapter 1, and then what we discovered is that you are created in the image of God. It says, verse 27, and God created them male and female, He created them in His own image. So the masculine is the image of God, the feminine is the image of God, okay? And we're going to kind of go from there. So we all have soul desires. Ladies, your soul desire is just similar to men, and that is, is to have value, to be affirmed, to, to know who you are, the, the desire of your soul. It can only be satisfied in knowing God, uh, walking with Jesus. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. But what's interesting is, whereas the masculine has a tendency to focus on finding worth through work and doing stuff, women in general tend to find value in their relationships, right? And so that creates a disconnect with 50% of the population. Let's say a guy named Roger is attracted to a woman named Elaine. He asks her out to a movie. She accepts. They have a pretty good time. A few nights later, he asks her out to dinner, and again, they enjoy themselves. They continue to see each other regularly, and after a while, neither one of them is seeing anybody else. And then one evening when they're driving home, a thought occurs to Elaine, and without really thinking, she says it aloud. Do you realize, as of tonight, we've been seeing each other for exactly six months? And then there is silence in the car. <laughs> to Elaine, it seems like a very loud silence. She thinks to herself, Oh my, I wonder if it bothers him that I said that. Maybe he's been feeling confined by our relationship. Maybe he thinks I'm trying to push him into some kind of obligation that he doesn't want or isn't even sure of. And Roger is thinking, hmm, six months. <laughs> and Elaine is thinking, but hey, I'm not so sure I want this kind of relationship either. Sometimes I wish I had a little more space so I'd have time to think about whether I really want us to keep going the way we are, moving steadily towards... I mean, where are we going? Are we just going to keep seeing each other at this level of intimacy? Are we headed towards marriage, towards children, towards a lifetime together? Am I ready for that level of commitment? Do I even really know this person? <laughs> and Roger is thinking, so that means it was, let's see, February when we started going out. <laughs> which was right after I had the car at the dealer's, which means, oh, let me check the odometer. Whoa, I'm way overdue for an oil change. <laughs> And Elaine is looking at him. He's upset. I can see it on his face. Maybe I'm reading this completely wrong. Maybe he wants more from our relationship, more intimacy, more commitment. Maybe he has sensed, even before I sense it, that I was feeling some reservations. Yes, I bet that's it. That's why he's so reluctant to say anything about this on his own. He's afraid of being rejected. And Roger is thinking, I'm going to have them look at that transmission again. <laughs> I don't. No, what, I don't care what those morons say. It's still not shifting right. They better not blame it on the cold weather this time. What cold weather? It's 87 degrees outside. And this thing is shifting like a garbage truck. And Elaine is thinking, he's angry. <laughs> and I don't blame him. I'd be angry too. God, I feel so guilty pushing him through this. But I can't help the way I feel. I'm just not sure. And Roger's thinking, they'll probably say it's only a 90-day warranty. And that's exactly what they're going to say, those scumballs. And Elaine is thinking, maybe I'm just too idealistic, waiting for a knight to come riding up on his white horse. And when I'm sitting right next to a perfectly good person, a person I enjoy being with, a person I truly care about, a person who seems to truly care about me, a person who's in pain because of my self-centered schoolgirl romantic fantasy. And Roger is thinking, warranty? I'll take that warranty and I'm going to shove it right up. Roger, Elaine says. What, says Roger, startled. Please don't torture yourself like this. She says, her eyes beginning to brim with tears. Maybe I should never have, oh my, I feel so, she breaks down sobbing. What, Roger says. <laughs> I'm such a fool, says Elaine. I mean, I know there's no night. I really know that. It's silly. There's no night and there's no horse. There's no horse, says Roger. 
You think I'm a fool, don't you? No. Roger's so happy to finally get one answer correct. <laughs> it's just that, it's that, I need some time, Elaine says. There's a 15-second pause while Roger, thinking as fast as he tr can, tries to come up with a safe response. Finally, he comes up with one, one that he thinks might work. Yes, <laughs> he says. Elaine, deeply moved, touches his hand. Oh, Roger, do you really feel that way? What way? That way about time. Oh, yes, says Roger. And then Elaine turns to face him, gazes deeply into his eyes, causing him to become very nervous about what she might say next, especially if it involves a horse. <laughs> At last she speaks, thank you, Roger. She says, he goes, thank you. He takes her home. She lies on her bed, conflicted, tortured soul, and weeps until the dawn, whereas Roger gets back to his place, opens a bag of Doritos, turns on the TV, and immediately becomes deeply involved in a rerun of a tennis match between two Czechoslovakians he's never heard of. A tiny voice in the far recess of his, of his mind tells him that something major was going to go back on in that car, but he's pretty sure there's no way he could ever understand it. So the next day, Elaine will call her closest friend, or perhaps two of them, and they will talk about the situation for six straight hours. <laughs> in painstaking detail, they will analyze everything she said and everything he said, going over it time and time again, exploring every word, expression, and gesture for nuances of meaning, considering every possible ramification. They will continue to discuss this subject off and on for weeks, maybe months, never reaching any definite conclusions, but they're never getting bored of the conversation. Meanwhile, Roger, playing racquetball one day with a mutual friend of his and Elaine's, will pause just before serving, frown and say, Norm, did Elaine ever own a horse? <laughs> <laughs> Dave Barry, the man right there. <laughs> Look. I know that's, that's humor, but sometimes humor communicates something, and that is the truth is, is that women and men look at the world totally differently when it comes to relationships. And the whole goal, uh, the whole hope of the teaching in the New Testament is that women will discover who they really are in Christ. Our hope for all women is, is wholeness and meaning and fulfillment in your life. And that is the message of the New Testament, and that you can discover your true self in Jesus. So let's go to our text where we've been for the last four weeks, and we're in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're focusing on verses 1 through 5, 17 through 32. Now, we, we really don't have time to, to read it all today, but I just want to give you some more specific application truths from this text. Now, if you'd like to go back and dig into this text, you can go back into the first and second messages of this series, or you can listen to The Salty Pastor, where every Tuesday we do an in-depth study on the text. It's a podcast, or you can watch it on YouTube. Now, notice on verse 1 of chapter 4, he says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So the first point is very critical, and that is, if you want to be a woman that fulfills God's image within you, and you want to overcome the influence of the taint, which is called the fall of man or sin, then focus on becoming the healthiest, strongest, most courageous woman you can be. Live in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Live in the manner worthy of the calling for which you have been called. Jesus is calling you to become fulfilled and complete in Him. Remember, C.S. Lewis, last week I quoted him, I'll quote him again, and that is, our true selves are waiting for us in Him. We find out who we really are in Christ. And this is very important, because if you're a female, there's nothing incomplete or insufficient with the feminine image of God within you. One is a whole number, okay? One is a whole number, and your soul and its dreams, its desires, all of these things, its thirsts, are a reflection of the image of God within you. That's important to understand. 
And so, but you have to realize, just like we put two glasses filled with uh, different colors of water up here, is that, is that when you crash into people, when you bump into people, your friends, your parents, your kids, or if you're married, your spouse, boom, you, stuff comes out of you, right? It comes out of you because they crashed into you. And if they wouldn't have crashed into you and if they weren't so annoying, then you wouldn't have reacted that way, right? But the illustration also says it comes out because it's in there. And it's in there because we've been tainted. And what happens is we need to realize that if you are a female, you are not insufficient in the desires of your soul as the feminine representation of the image of God. But just like guys, you need to deal with the influence of the taint. And that's why the world in which you live breeds insecurity within your life. One of the biggest struggles across the board, it's been researched, uh, across, I mean, it's conclusions that the thing that women tend to struggle with, maybe you're a woman who doesn't, but it tend to struggle with more than anything else is insecurity. And insecurity, you could be really secure in this area of your life, and this area of your life, and this area of your life, and then you'll have this other area of your life where you feel really insecure, Right? You may be really secure in the fact that you're, you're in your career, you know? You're a neurosurgeon. You know how to do it. You're one of the best. You're one of the tops over here. But when it comes to your hair, you're a little insecure, right? You, you might be really secure over here in this area, you know? You could be a college professor. You, you could have it over here. But raising your children, you're feeling a little insecure, right? And guess what? That guys are that way. Women are that way. We're all that way. And so that insecurity, though, is fed upon and is breeded by the society in which you live. One of the reasons for this is it tries to teach in our society today that, well, first and foremost, women deserve it all. You can have it all. You can do it all. And guess what? The reason you can't is because of men. It's all their fault. They're standing in their way. They're holding your back. There's glass ceilings and patriarchy, and there's all these types of things going on, and we just live in this chauvinistic world. And if men would just get out of the way, you would be in charge, and the world would be a better place. Now, that may be true. I'm not trying to debate that. But what I am saying, though, is that if that is a part of your psychological makeup, can you rationally and intellectually for a moment see the paradigm that sets up for you? And that is, I can have it all, but it's men standing in my way. But guess who sets all the standards of what you want? It's women. It's other women. Men don't set the standards for the way you should dress or the way you look. All the magazines, all the media, all the producers on TV that come up with all that stuff are all other women who create those unrealistic expectations for you. So, so the truth of the matter is, is, is become the best woman that Jesus is calling you to be. Discover your true self in Him and Him alone. And when you do that, you will discover more happy endings than you could ever imagine in your life. You, you'll, ha, you'll, have, you'll write better happy endings to your relationship story in your dating life than you could ever imagine, you know? You don't need to be weird or creepy, you know, I'm dating Jesus right now. Okay, that sounds a little weird, I think, okay? A uh, little creepy. Just say, you know, I, I, I want God to fill my soul so that when I meet other people, uh, what I'm doing is I am evaluating if I want to have a lifelong loving relationship with this person, you know, based on the fullness of who I am. I'm not trying to get this person to fill a need that they can never fill anyway. So that's a really important part. You know, I know a lot of guys who get married when they're really young and they, they, they get married and then it takes them about 20, sometimes 30 years to figure out that, uh, my job is to love my wife. Okay, I'll work on that. 
But for you ladies, what you have to understand, and, and you know, I don't want to be controversial, I just want you to think through this, is that the fullness of who you are can only come through knowing Jesus And when that happens, that gives you a freedom in your parenting, in your marriage, in your friendships that you haven't previously held before because there's no insatiable need for those things. And and that right there is why pursuing who God created you to be is the best thing ever for you. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And the second thing is this, is that um, this sounds kind of trite, meaning servicey, but I think it's really, really important, and we gloss over it way too quick. And this is what I'd say to ladies, is choose who you're going to listen to in your life and really think about that and evaluate that. Who really influences me? Who really do I listen to when it comes down to the most important values that I'm going to hold? when it comes down to the most important perception of who I am as a woman. Am am I going to listen to what the world says to me? Because what the world says to me is it holds up a mirror and you stand in front of it. And the, the mirror, mirror on the wall says you don't measure up at all right? It, that's what the world says. You can find something wrong with you in the world's mirror. But when you listen to what Jesus says about you, you really have to turn down the noise of the world and turn up the volume of His voice in your life and, and start to listen to what He says about you. Because what does He say about you? I guarantee you it's a totally different message than what the world says about you. So listen to verses 17 through 19 so we can get specific, okay? I'll read them again. I want to tell you this, and I insist on it. So I'm going to tell you and then insist that you listen to me. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. So the whole way of thinking about who you are as a woman constructed by the world, okay, is futile according to the Scripture. They are darkened in their understanding. They're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge every kind of impurity. They are full of greed. You know, what's really interesting biblically when they talk about greed, what greed is, is it's an insatiable thirst that can never be quenched. You never have what? Enough. So, so oftentimes we think of greed in the terms of what? Money. That, that's generally how it is construed. But when the Bible's talking about greed, it's talking about these desires of your soul that become insatiable. And when you use the world to try to quench them, what happens? They're never quenched. Just like Jesus met the woman at the well, right? He says, if you drink from this well, you're going to do what? Thirst again. And what was he really saying? He says, you've lived your whole life drinking from the wrong well, and what are you? Relationally, you are thirsty. You're on your fifth guy. And he says, but if you drink from the water that I give you, your soul will what? Never thirst again. Now, why is that? Why does the world do this? Now, I know this is a little intellectual here, and, but, but women, you know, high IQ people. So uh, that you, you'll get this. And that is, is, number one is it's not what you're thinking, but you've been trained to think in a certain way. In postmodern deconstructionist theory, if you've gone to public education system anywhere in the last 50 years, you've been trained to think as a deconstructionist. If you've watched movies or TV, you've been trained to think like a deconstructionist. It's a way of thinking. It makes you skeptical of truth claims, right? We're skeptical of those things. Now, if you are trained as a skeptic, a deconstructionist, and then you add the number one issue that women struggle with is insecurity, what have you got? You've got a bonfire and you're dumping gas on it. Because deconstructionism, skepticism heightens insecurity because it removes all claims to any type of foundational truths on which you can stand. Now, if you take that and then you realize that we have, as a culture, been steeped in third-wave feminist ideology, and this is where I asked the security team to make sure there was no rotten fruit in the room, um, this is the thing I get the most emails about. So, always, is that uh, invariably somebody will uh, send me an email where they'll go to Webster's Dictionary and they will 
take the definition of feminism and send it to me. And what I send back to him says, uh, yeah, you need to do a little research because that is not what's going on. <laughs> that is not. Third wave feminism is loud, it's aggressive, and it is the predominant ideology in all of our universities, public and private, across the board. And what happens is in this ideology, it's based on a Marxist construct, which basically says that all relationships that you have are purely power relationships. And so you better get your power on. You need girl power so that you can negotiate this world. What it does is it turns you into constantly competing with everybody else. Whereas all psychological research says the exact same thing over and over again is that the number one feminine quality of all females is agreeableness. And that's what makes them so successful in the world. And so do you see the contradiction there? These contradictions do what? They feed on our insecurities as human beings, and particularly for women. Some research just came out from Barna, talks about if you're a woman under 40 years of age, 70% have no purpose in life. And think about that. Wow, seven out of 10 women, no purpose in life under 40 years of age. Today, we see this in the divorce statistics. 30 years ago, well, probably 25 years ago, uh, when divorce was initiated, 52% of men have initiated divorces and 48% of men initiated or women. So it's 52, 48, men versus women. Today, 70% of all divorces are initiated by women. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not warranted at times. It is. But it's interesting to me that you would see such a massive data shift. And what's the correlation or causation to that? Could it be? Would you consider that it has a lot to do with our society's drive and push to manipulate women to become what they want that creates such insecurity and disappointment in their own lives? So the, the third thing he says this is in this passage of Scripture, and the third thing I would challenge you to consider this, and I know these are bigger ideas, and, but I think these ideas are so upstream that when you grab onto them, they make a massive difference in your downstream relationships. And that is try to chart new courses. You know, you, you have a capacity to grow and to change in such an uh, um, amazing way, ladies. So I would encourage you to constantly try and chart new courses in your relationships, particularly if they're not going in the direction that you believe God is guiding you to go. Listen what he says in verse 20. That, however, is not the life that you've learned in Christ. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self because it's being corrupted. Verse 23, you need to be made new in the attitude of your mind. Put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So you've learned in Christ to put aside the old self and put on the new self. This is a promise from God that every relationship in your life can be redirected, redeemed, restored, you know. That's a wonderful thing that you can change where it's going. See, Jesus is alive. He raised from the dead. And today he is redeeming you and he's redeeming the relationships in your life. It's never too late to chart a new course. And his way satisfies your soul. It is a wellspring that overflows into every other area of your relational life. So to chart a new course, the first thing I would encourage you to do is seek discipleship among other women that grows you. You know, you, you can start off, uh, uh, there's a new group for women uh, led by my wife and another gal, and it's come and go. You can just start easy, you come and go, you ask questions. Find women that you can respect and that you can ask questions about your own relationship life with. Uh, it's really, really important that you find these discipleship opportunities. Uh, when it comes to your communication, okay, this is where you need to chart a new course. Now, remember what we said before is that what's the number one toxin to all of your relationships, your friendships, your dating, uh, your marriage, your kids, your coworkers, your boss? It's unresolved conflict. That is a toxin that undermines and destroys all relationships. 
Now, I think that women understand this. Let's say you're married and you understand this. And so what happens is you want to communicate, right? And the problem, though, I think comes up is that women and men mean different things when they communicate, and they communicate for different reasons. Oftentimes, now I've been a full-time pastor now for about 34 years, and so over those years, I've spent a lot of time counseling couples, and they come in. And it's not always this way, but I would say in general, in general, is that I sit down, I say, let's diagnose the problem. And so they'll sit there and they'll start talking. And invariably, it comes down to her perspective is, is we have a failure to communicate problem, right? We're not communicating, all right? And then his, his problem is generally is, I don't know what to do. You know, I'm doing this and, it does, I, and then she doesn't like it, you know? And so that's kind of the two categories. And what that really is, is that both are communicating, they just communicate for different reasons. See, women communicate as general. You may be different. I grant that. But in general, consider this. You communicate to resolve conflict because communication is understanding. If I could just get you to understand where I'm coming from, if you would just understand me, if you just understand what I'm going through, then that will resolve the conflict, Right? Guys don't communicate that way at all. Guys are wired to problem solve, right? So if you come to here and you say, you know, I'm feeling, a, you know, a little bothered, you know, with my boss at work because my boss said such and such and such and such. Do you know what your husband's going to respond, respond with? Is he going to say, tell me about it. You know, how do you feel about that? What do you really think, you know? And, and how did he say it? Did he say it with this tone or did he say it with that tone? And what was he really trying to get at? And what's the history of his communications in the past? You know, the best predictor of future behavior is past habits, right? So what happened over there? Is that how your husband talks? No. I mean, he'll say one of three things. He's going to say, you want me to go over there and punch him in the face? Right? That's what your husband's going to do. He's going to uh, it doesn't mean nothing. He's a jerk anyway, you know. You see, cause, because guys are wired in a way to do what? Solve problems. And so one of the things is chart a new course. See the communicative style of your husband and how he's created by God. And if you want to communicate, chart a new course and try to engage him with that. Now, I want you to know a couple of rules of communication. These are just general. These are all free. Um, the five most feared words in any husband's life. Honey, we need to talk. <laughs> what do we need to talk about? You know, honey, we need to talk. And so you're thinking I'm asking him out on a date, right? That's what you're thinking. He thinks it's an invitation to the battlefield, right? He's like, oh my goodness, man. His situational awareness is going up. Because as soon as you say that, you know what he starts doing? He has these files in his head that he has put and closed in a filing cabinet and locked away. Because guys can do that. They can put all these issues, you know, they put them in a file like this. They go, hmm, here's all the stuff that's really bothering me. <laughs> Click and walk away. <laughs> guys can do that, right? We can categorize stuff. So you know what he does? As soon as you say that, he goes, where's the key? <laughs> where's the key? Where is it? Okay, what did I say? What have I done? Um, 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 I got to find it. Oh, that, is that it? Is that it? Is that it? That's what he's doing. He's going back. So one of the best things to do, I think, and this is a, a, a suggestion for you to consider, is that if you're married and you want to communicate with your guy and you have a conflict or you're feeling uh, uh, separated from him and you want to resolve it in communication, it's approach it like to say, hey, I don't feel like we're on the same page about this. And how can you and I get on the same page about this? So what have you done? Well, first of all, you're brilliant. <laughs> because what have you done? You've defined the problem properly, and then you've asked for a solution. And so what are you doing? You are, you are engaging him in the process of what? Solving your problem together. See, most people solve conflicts separately. So their conflicts pull them apart. People who are filled in walking with Jesus want to resolve conflicts in a way that pulls them together. And that's a critical point. 
I believe that, ladies, uh, if I may be so bold as to suggest, that you undermine your relationship with the men in your life by doing two things. The first thing you do is you withhold affirmation. I know women who are frustrated with their husbands, and so they get really, really good about criticizing their husbands. They're negative about their husbands. They show contempt for their husbands. When their husband finally does something to help them, they go, well, it's about time, you know. And what you don't realize is that God has wired men to seek the affirmation of the women in their life. The the words that you speak and the things that you do have the most influence other than God on your husband's heart. And you want to carry that with great care. Use words that, remember one of the seven practical steps that we go through in Ephesians? Use words well. Use your words well. The other thing that, that you do sometimes is you, you, you avoid accountability. And that is, is that, ladies, sometimes, if I may be so bold as to suggest, you're really good at pointing out all of the flaws of your husband, right? Or the mistakes that they make, and you'll let him know, and he knows them all, right? But if he points out one thing, what happens? Yeah, World War III. So, so you avoid accountability. So if your husband is saying, I'm sorry a lot, then maybe you should start saying it as much as he is. Now, I'd like to leave you with something here in the end of our time together, because I don't have time to address everything. But I believe that the Scriptures teach some really powerful things. And I want you to, the last thing I say is oftentimes the thing you remember the most. And here's what I want you to hear, okay? If God were saying something, if Jesus was in the room, I believe this is what he would say. You really are beautiful. You're more beautiful than you think. And the reason is because, well, you're not beautiful because of the color or the texture or the shine of your hair. You're not beautiful because you're super thin or athletic. You're not beautiful because you have zero smile lines or crow's feet around your eyes. You're not beautiful because you always know the right thing to say or have the best jokes. You're not beautiful because your children are perfect or your husband might be the talk of the town. Maybe you're the hottest date during the gala and benefit season, which is upon us now. But that's not why you're beautiful. You're not beautiful because you're the smartest person in the room, the most capable person in the room, or the most successful person in the room. You're beautiful for one reason and one reason only, because you've been washed, you've been redeemed, you've been made new by the blood of Christ. The King of kings and the Lord of lords came to suffer so that you could be free. He gave all of himself so that you could find yourself. And what makes you beautiful is not the the new thing around the corner. It's not the wonder or the beauty of, of your own externalities. It is the wonder and beauty of a clean and pure heart washed by the blood of Christ. And as you follow him, as you follow him, you will not only discover the glorious beauty on which he has bestowed upon you, you will begin to write some of the greatest storybook endings that you could ever imagine. This series is giving us practical steps to improve the relationships of our lives. This week we focused on women, but we have so much to learn, and you won't want to miss a single message in this series. So invite a friend, and come back next week and hear the next one. If you need help on your walk or you're ready to start your walk, please don't wait. Text FHNEW to 72000. We want to encourage you to grow. For those at home, please take some time to consider what you've heard today by reviewing the discussion question. If you're on campus, please stand for the closing blessing.